and AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's edition of XY Live. Uh, actually live from ZeroCon today. I'm sitting in the Melbourne Convention Centre. Um, so hopefully none of the sessions come out because I'm just outside. Uh, we've got Manish Wadwa with us uh, from Humanity in Business. Welcome Manish. Hi guys, hi, how are you doing? <clears throat> Good to have you. Um, there's some awesome stuff we're going to be covering with Manish today around um, best practice employment, um, how the best businesses do it, uh, and he's going to have a few suggestions around what advisors take out. We're even going to have a look at how maybe we can do it with clients. Uh, first, first, a big shout out to AIA, uh, the partner that um, supports XY Live. If you haven't checked out their their Vitality program, uh, we definitely suggest you do it. It's it's a really unique proposition for clients and a lot of practices that have been using it uh, have a big uptick in engagement with insurance. Uh, there's a lot of health benefits that start to flow through to clients, boost juice, vouchers, et cetera, things like that. Uh, that so they're doing a really cool job there. So um, check it out. So Manish, um, humanity in business, let's, let's, let's talk a bit about um, what, what that is and what you've been doing over the last few years because it's a really big passion project of yours and I've, um, I've seen you present about it before. Um, share, share with the guys um, what it's about. Yeah, so really humanity and business is really about um, two things and one of the main things is all about um, you know, values and purpose within the business space. So I guess what we're trying to do is we realize that the biggest challenge corporations face today is about employee engagement um, and, and really people being passionate about and loving what they do. Um, the employee engagement rate currently in most co companies is around 30%, which means more than half of your employees are pretty much don't want to be there. They're doing jobs where they're kind of, ambi you know, kind of ambivalent about it and not really want to be in that, in that space. Um, but so really, I believe that as change gets exponentially faster and quicker, uh, employee engagement is going to be a big issue. And so what we're doing is that we realize that the key to employee engagement is leadership. And you should speaking of AIA, the CEO of AIA, Damien Mu is an exceptional leader. He's very young. He's speaking at one of my events in February next year, but really it comes down to what kind of leaders are creating engagement within their organizations to drive change and to create better outcomes. So what we do is we basically look at sharing the importance of how do we build leadership capability to actually help, uh, drive better business outcomes, but also what does that new leadership look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what if people don't know what great leadership is because they've never really seen it. You know, I said, mm -hmm. like, you know, you talk to people in businesses, they're like, you know, how amazing is your business leader? And like, what are you talking about? You know, am my leader, we have a toxic culture. It's like your boss is telling us, get on with it and do it. And really having great leadership is almost like no one's really heard of great leadership. And then now you've got the government and that, that's a different story. But Pretty much there's a gap of huge leadership in business. And I guess what we're doing is building a brand around great leadership. Okay. Are you finding that you can um, put different leaders in, um, I guess, certain styles and boxes? Is that sort of how things play out? Or is each business completely unique? Is that what sort of, no, what's your take on it? A lot of the leaders have similar uh, values. Um, mm -hmm. And regardless of the business you're in, whether you're an advisor, whether you're an investor, whether you're a bank, whether you're a manufacturing company, Great leaders have pretty much very, you know, great, are very aware of their own values and what's important to them. Mm -hmm. um, and they put people and people at the heart of everything they do, um, okay. not profit. So it's people before profit. So if you walked into a, a business like this afternoon and you'd start with uh, the values of the, the leaders, is that sort of where you'd begin? Yeah. So what we do is we do lots of events around, I guess, show, putting the light and showcasing the light on what does great leadership look like. Mm -hmm. So we host a lot of events and they talk about, here's what I do and how I lead my people. And it's about walking the talk, you know? So it's very good to put the values on the, on the wall and, you know, do the beautiful, beautiful vision statements on the website. But the reality is when, when, the, when the shit hits the fan, what does it look like and how do the leaders react um, and how do they take care of their people? And that's really yeah. hard to do. Okay. So, so like you're saying that, yeah, 
you can do the initial stuff and sort of put it all down and think about it. But unless um, a, a, is a part of what you do with leaders is actually make sure, help them maintain that and um, right. sort of walk the walk. So we, do, we take their stories um, and then educate other executives around, well, it, that, that's how this leader's done it. Uh, what does it take for you to do it? And it's about really, it's almost like we have to re-educate people around their values, what's important mm -hmm. to them. You know, most of us haven't really been educated around what's it like to be a good human being. Mm -hmm. It's something we've learned from our parents and growing up. And, but really around our leadership development, it's never really been integrated. And even from school upwards, it's never been integrated, including in, the, in the, all, the, all the business domains like project management, investment, financial services. The mm -hmm. leadership conversation only comes later on. It's not like they te teach it to you, you know, in depth as you go, mm -hmm. um, right from the ground up. So we basically... Do you find it's a, really an experience thing most of the time or...? Sorry, say that again? Is it, do you find it's an experience thing? Yeah, absolutely experiential. You've got to go through it yourself. And that's the only way to learn. You've got to learn mm. the hard way. And you've got to do it to realize what's working and what's not working. Mm. And I guess, do you, as a sort of part of what you're doing, you're sort of giving a few shortcuts to a lot of other letters by sharing their stories. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So by sharing the stories, people can get ideas. Oh, okay, that's how I need to do it. And there, there are sometimes things, difficult things like hard conversations with people restructuring going on and mm -hmm. it takes a certain kind of leadership to do that in a nice way which doesn't you know uh, mm. piss people off and, and get stuff done out of them so we really i guess through our events educate on mm. how to do things differently lead change differently do projects differently do customer centricity differently so what's the closest business that you've worked with to like a financial advice practice or have you worked with a financial advice practice um, well you know you mentioned aia in the beginning um, yeah you know, the, the Vitality program, the, great, the greatest leaders, and AI is one of the biggest, better companies out there, are actually um, not the, the Vitality program, which you're talking about, is actually a, a fantastic role, example of great leadership because mm -hmm. Damien, who's the CEO there, has actually looked at his first thing is about his people and then his customers. So he's mm -hmm. actually extremely passionate about, you know, ensuring their employees are taken care of, but at the same time, making sure that that really translates into welfare and well-being for their customers. Mm -hmm. So that is at the heart of his leadership. It's not like, oh, we're doing it because it's a good idea and let's make a quick buck out of it and therefore it's a good you know, business model. It might take a longer play to get money out of or get a return on investment, mm -hmm. but it will eventually. So it's a more sustainable way of doing business. So, do, you find, yeah, do you find these, these are usually like a, it's a long play sometimes yeah, or very yeah. commonly? Correct. And that's the hard bit, right? The long mm -hmm. play. Who wants to play the long game or who wants to play the short? If you want to play the short game, you can do it. It's always been done, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to play the long game, that's really where the value is at. And, you know, the best companies are playing the long game. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's just the leadership part is balancing out the short-term right. pressures to, right. to sort of and defend that long-term vision as much as possible. So it, it, it. plays that's through. And good leaders will always put people first, no matter how hard the pressures are when to perform short term, um, they will still push back and say, no, we are in for the long term. Therefore, the people element is always the first thing. And that's a hard thing to do when you're getting hammered from all sides. Yeah. Well, I think like if we think about advice practices out there, that's it is one of the hardest bloody thing. The single planner advisors out there. I, I have, I've, I've been one, I am one. Um, it's hard. And I think a lot of guys will be going, well, yeah, it's really hard. So that the, the the challenge of that long play versus the short play, and with a lot of advisors out there, sort of um, putting more thought into their advice solution or their process, it's a bit of that space because that like every time everyone in X Y advisor is sort of iterating what they're doing, Correct. that's that's a form of leadership. They're, they're leading their clients to a new outcome, totally. uh, and that time investment is always at the expense of um, some sort of short term. You could be seeing another client and just doing the same thing and actually bringing in some money. Correct. So, Correct. yeah. And I think that's tough. the talk, it's sticking to those guns. And when you talk about ethical investment, um, those are long plays. And, you know, there are companies that are out there doing the right thing, but it comes over time. And Unilever is a great example. You know, the CEO there has pushed back on, on company, on investors and said, if you want short-term games, we are not your company. Go somewhere mm -hmm. else and find short-term. We are interested in the moms and dads who want long-term investment with us. And that's the kind of investor we're looking for. So mm. really it comes down to um, the kind of companies that you invest in as well. And also, of course, the advisor has to play a big, big role in that. 
With the advice practices, um, is there any suggestions around where you've seen some of the companies balance that out really well and how they do that? Because obviously these big businesses you're dealing with, they've, they've got this, um, this challenge of balancing the short term versus the long term. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've seen that have really helped to facilitate that and make sure the short term objectives get taken care of? Well, I think uh, the great example is a company called Konica Minolta. Um, mm -hmm. They're a tech company. You know, they make printers. You're probably familiar with the brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a brand, in a, in a tech company, which is highly disrupted in a printer market, who makes who print stuff anymore? But the point is, the guys have, because of their focus on people, they have grown their market share and taken business away from their competitors. Mm -hmm. And what he's done is, over time, because of his focus on employee engagement and, and building the people skill set capability, mm -hmm. he's actually grown his business in a market that's not growing at all. So, so you're saying there's been more immediate effects um, from that focus as well as the longer absolutely. term? Absolutely. So yeah. what's happened is that the customers have seen that, that their commitment to their customers and to their people and that they're there to support the customers for the long term. And because of the shift in, in the values, the customers have stuck on and they've got new customers as a result of that. Mm. So... And the pressures of short term has always caught cuts because, hey, you know, the market's shrinking, you know, the printer market's dying, there's, it's not growing. So naturally, the pressures are going to be hammered. But the leaders, you know, there, David Cook, who runs the company there, has pushed back on that and said, no, well, we're going to stick to it because this is our strategy. And he's constantly fighting back. But it takes, again, it comes back to the leadership conversation, right? Mm. Are you a strong enough leader to say, no, I'm going to stick with my guns? Or are you going to buckle into pressure and start, you know, doing what, whatever they tell you to do? Well, I suppose a good way to relate it to advice practices is the referred client um, aspect. So most, like most of the best practices get referrals from their existing clients. Cool. And to me, that's, that's always been, that's, that's the focus. If you um, can make your business more referable, um, then that, that's, that's a great business model. Uh, but I, I guess the challenge around that, and, and that's, uh, it's that extra time and effort with those existing clients to get, get that happening. And I suppose that's um, a lot of advisors, some of the advisors, there's some great XY live sessions we've had where um, practices that have developed really um, get a lot of client referrals. Um, a lot of it comes down to time or time with the client. Um, so, yeah, so it is still that trade-off, but I guess. It is. It is. And I think, you know, if there's some companies that are focused on the short term, then, you know, they, they lose the people and the, the people won't want to work for them. And, you know, Advisors might not want to work for a practice owner that's, you know, always focused on short terms, particularly if, if it comes at a cost to the customer and a cost to the, you know, might get win short terms, but with, and if, then we have, it's a personal choice we have to make. Do we want to mm. stick around with this company? Do we want to move on and find somebody who wants to play the long game? Yeah, well, that's like for the employed advisors out there, that's, I know plenty of stories where that's exactly what's played out and they just, they end up leaving. So like from a practice owner standpoint, if you're employing advisors, um, that's something that you really need to be conscious of. Uh, totally. Totally. It's, I think it's, it's important to even qualify that when you're getting interviewed or going into a new practice, you know, mm. what, what do you guys, how do you work? What do you guys look at? You know, what, what's your culture like? And you're really drilling down on the cultural leadership style of, of, the, of the practice owner and the culture. What are some of the questions that you you'd ask if you went into a practice? Well, I think that choosing the right uh, practice and, and stand, speaking to not just the people who interview, but the other employees, mm. you know, in the, in the business and say, well, how, what's, what's it like working there? Mm -hmm. You know, you're working your ass off 12 hours a day, not, you know, or no work-life balance. Are you, you know, do you, are, are you, does the leader understand you? Does he care about you? And not more than putting foosball tables and giving you uh, beer after work on Friday, but does he actually there to support your growth and development as a, as a, as part of their team. So, you know, some of the questions are very much directly, directly to uh, employees who can mm -hmm. give you a great insight around what the leadership and, and the culture there is like. So yeah. speak to more than just the interviewer and the, and the manager who interviews you, you know, and ask to, if you can speak to the other employees. And so, if, and for the practice owners, I guess, um, make sure you talk to all the people. And so everyone's um, got the same story about the practice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, to be honest, I mean, the practice owner, if he's really, if he's really walking the talk, um, then people will say the guy is a good guy or the guy is, she's really doing well and she's, she's really genuine in her care for people or not just saying one thing but doing another, you know. Mm. Um, people will still away pick it up. It's not rocket science and you know how the, the, the practice owner is operating and whether they're a good operator or not. Yeah, that's fair enough. Have we... 
what's we, we like to say sometimes x x y like a, the good bloke test sort of thing um that's always a simple assessment we, we, so we're talking about the long long um, long game versus short game sort of thing and and like that sort of sacrifice initially to do you have some gold and some suggestions that people could just go and do now today like if they wanted to do some instant uptick in their business what are some of the things that you've seen businesses do when they've had instant turnaround in terms of how employees have engaged with what they're doing um, and the, how the business is operated? Um, I think in terms of the instant turnaround thing, I think, again, we, it, it's a bit challenging to get it straight off the bat, it, you know, because we're talking about the human, it's a time thing, right? So I think the first thing easily is really having real conversations. And I think the hard part is having the real conversation, you know, what, taking feedback, what am I not doing well? What can we do better? How can we better support you? And I think the, the great individual, people, the great leaders that I've come to are straight away, you know, genuinely care about their customer and their employees, genuinely, not because they have to, but because they want to make a difference. Mm. And I think putting on and truly giving a shit that's beyond just, oh, I need to do this because it's my job, there's a difference. And you can see the difference straight away when somebody approaches you on, you know, when you pick up a phone and deal with customer service with Telstra, you know, you can tell which customer service guy truly cares about your call or not, mm. right? Yeah, so well, it that, affects how angry you get at them. <laughs> <laughs> so the immediate thing for is literally talk to your stakeholders, talk to your customers first up and just mm. get feedback and how you can improve, how you can add value, constantly looking for that way of engaging and helping them out. And it's and helping beyond just return on investment. It's, mm. it's the great guys who do customer service and, and help their customers go beyond that. And mm. I think it's that beyond conversation, which is what does that look like for your for your business? You know. Well, that's that's I guess that's a it's a good segue into the client space. Uh, mm-hmm. I know a lot of um, a lot of the best practices out there do client surveys. Um, so, for example, the practice of the year advisor of the year um, with the AFA, they go out and survey those advisors' clients, and right. they get direct feedback around how they're doing. Um, so that's more of an assessment of how they're doing in general. And there's lots of really good insights. Um, a number of practices now do, um, so for example, I'm going to be adopting a net promoter score, um, in, in my practice at certain points in the advice process. Um, I know there's, there's some practices that, um, do phone calls and just sort of really try and, um, so is that, is that, that a big thing for advisors to just go out and ask? And it's not rocket science, man. It's, mm. You know, it's the simple principles of human to human engagement. It's not like you ask to do massive technology implementation to create a CRM system that's going to create this feedback loop. No, you're just calling up someone and saying, man, how can I, how can I help you, man? What are you struggling with? Are you in, unclear about? And it's as simple as picking up the phone or setting up a meeting. It really is. So there's but no magic, here. magic pills you got for us. Uh, <laughs> um, make the call, call people you haven't spoken to for a call customers, call people you haven't spoken to for a while and ask for the feedback and how can, how you can better serve them literally with, with what you're offering. Pretty so simple. I think That's it's pretty, if, I would love it if, if my super guy called me up more often um, and said, man, what do you think about our investment so far? What do you think you've done? How are we doing? You know, no one's ever called me. Well, send, send us his details. I'm sure there's plenty of guys out there listening now that would be happy to take over what he's doing there, Manish. So. <laughs> So there's plenty of room for growth, man. And trust me, with the market the way it is, with, there is, it's not hard to disrupt and be genuine in your approach, mm. um, you know, because not many people are really doing that. Okay. So, so, the, the comp- so simple concept generally that plays out when you are dealing with businesses and what you see uh, from what they're doing, but then I guess the complexity comes in with each of the businesses uh, functions and the different people involved in the business and trying to, um, so for example, I guess when you think about, okay, easy for an advisor to go, yep, I'm just going to call my practices. What about inspiring your team to adopt that? And, um, I guess yeah. what a, is that where the leadership comes into play a bit more? Correct. And I think this is where the leadership space is, you know, if, if most of us have not been really gone through the rigorous hard yards of training of leadership, the great leaders come through the hard yards of learning the hard way. You know, getting slapped around a bit, realizing I, I messed up and then uh, uh, changing that. So I think really, um, you know, getting a, a leadership advisor or coach uh, mm-hmm. is, is probably the first step. People think, oh, yeah, I don't really need a coach. I'm good. 
but man, trust me, everyone needs a coach. Um, someone who can be a sounding board, feedback. I think the challenge for most leaders and people in businesses is a self-awareness. Mm-hmm. You know, really knowing what is it that as a, individually, as you, if you're a leader, what are your um, vulnerabilities that might be showing up, which you might not be aware of, but other people can see it. Mm. Right? And that's a really hard thing to, and a lot of people in your team might be fair, afraid or not, or not wanting to point that out to you, but um, good leaders get feedback and openly seek it as well. So that self-awareness piece, is that? Yes. So that self-awareness piece, it can be cultivated, but you need feedback because if you don't get feedback, you don't know what to improve. Mm. But it takes, it takes guts, right? To tell someone, you know, you're, you're pretty shit at this and take it from somebody who works for you or your, or your colleague. Um, that's hard. Yeah. It's, well, I found it hard in the past to get, um, like you're asking for feedback and you, you want, you want a bit more directness, but sometimes it's, um, it's a challenge to get that because of a fear on the employee's side um, right. of pissing you off. or um, You have to set the space. You've got to be clear around, hey, listen, this is not, I'm not going to hold this against you or something. I'm asking you to be honest, and, but also make it constructive, right? So not just mm-hmm. tell me I'm shit. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so what, what's the problem, but also what's the solu- what do you suggest Correct. you yeah. do to fix it? And if you don't have one, but at least now you've heard it from somebody who works with you and you say, wow, because the best leaders sometimes – need a wake up call, right? They're like, by getting a feedback, they're like, wow, I wasn't realized I was doing that. Mm. And they're like, okay, okay, take point taken. And then they'll adjust their leadership style or they allow themselves to be caught out and say, all right, I did that again. Sorry, guys. You know? Um, so do, do a lot of the, like these large businesses that you deal with, do they, do you find that the, the leaders in those businesses have coaches as well? Is that something absolutely. that you said? Yeah, I mean, at the highest level, most of them do. They have a mentor, they have a coach. Um, spend an hour with them to get that feedback because it can be pretty lonely as a leader because, yeah. you know, there's so much pressure there to, to do stuff. Um, having someone who can sort of have a sounding board, I think it's quite critical. I've had one um, and still do. Um, so really recommend that because um, you might think that it's not useful, but actually at times when the chips are down and you're feeling the pressure, it's a great way to get feedback and release as well in terms of what's going on for you. Yeah. Well, like, with with the XY Advisor Group, I think it functions a bit as um, a bit of a sounding board for a lot of people, and it's yeah. been it's been great um, the engagement, the feedback that we're getting from advisors and what they're benefiting. But at the same time, I guess it doesn't replace. Um, there's a number of really good business coaches in the group as well that are out there, so um, I'd encourage everyone to check them out uh, because yeah, like it's there's nothing. I think that accountability piece is one of the key elements that um, comes into play. Totally. Accountability is what they, they hold you at and also feedback loop, which is really critical for, for leadership to improve. You know? do, you, do you operate on a certain, what's the time frames that you operate with, with your coaches? Oh, I, what do you mean in terms of how often do I see them? Yeah. Well, typically probably once, once a week. Um, okay. And it's not once a fortnight, depending on what's going on for me. Um, yeah. But I just find that, you know, even if it's something I'm unsure, because decisions can be really difficult sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get clarity on some decisions is really powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes a business and a leadership coach combined or separately is actually a really powerful combination. Yeah. Okay. So what, what complements do you, are you looking for someone that complements your skill set or understanding? So someone that has another sphere of, is that how you've, how, how this has worked for you? What's... Well, from, a lead, from a leadership perspective, I mean, uh, the complementing thing, I think, is more from a business perspective. So, mm-hmm. you know, people typically hire people who complement them really well. Mm-hmm. So they bring people on their team which did, and they don't have a similar skill set. So they have mm-hmm. somebody else who has different skill set. And that's yeah. really good from a business perspective. From a personal leadership perspective, it's very much a, a coach who understands the human behavior and, you know, and humanity, really. So knowing the, the personal development challenges that we can experience and having what are the challenges of becoming more self-aware. And mm. that's really hard when you're, when you're in the middle of crisis or a focus or pressure um, and chips are down and there's fear everywhere. That's when you need someone to sort of support you on that journey. Otherwise it can get pretty overwhelming, especially mm. I would think in the financial services industry, that's, uh, that would be pretty overwhelming with some of the pressures that the industry faces. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's, um, over the years, there's been lots of um, incidents that pop up and I'm sure it's uh, defined quite a lot of letters in this space. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
So the uh, we've got a question from the um, audience. Oh, Clay's. Um, yeah, it's sort of. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's more of a comment. We might take that as a comment. <laughs> Clay, Clay's just um, said he's happy to help out poking uh, poking holes in my leadership style. So thank thanks, Clay, and it's always good to know that someone's out there willing to do that for you. Uh, you make you make me a stronger leader, Clay. <laughs> So, so Manish, um, we were talking about going into the, the investment space. So I, I know there's, there's like, um, there's B Corp, um, where like, uh, there's, there's, it's a sort of an assessment of a type of business and the way they manage the business and yep. that they subscribe to. Um, what have you, what are, what are some of the things that you're aware of in this space and, um, some of the filters that, um, like if, if people really want to apply this to their investment regime, what, what are some of the things? So, that you, yes. It's funny you mentioned that. I was just looking at saying, man, if I knew, if I knew, if I had the money to invest, I'd probably know the company straight off the bat as to where to put my money in. Um, it's simply, I know the leaders. You've got AIA, great company to invest in right off the bat. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very simple: the culture and leadership. And a, a great uh, measure of that is look at the best places to work. You know, all the the list of great places to work. Um, best employers in Australia. There's a list of a couple of uh, consultancies run around, um, you know, how, how good the culture is and how good that is. And it's, if there are any public listed companies on that or by all means go for it, because to be honest, that's, they're all pretty consistent in their performance. And if you look at AIA, pretty consistent in the performance. There's um, uh, Unilever, there's a whole bunch of them. And if you look at it globally, there's so many. I mean, so those awards that they have around best places to work, do yeah, you find that, that it's not bullshit, that there is no, a correlation. There's a correlation there. There's a correlation there. So there's a couple of, there are mostly smaller companies in those lists, but there is some lists that have larger companies. Um, mm -hmm. the, the bigger the company, the probably harder it is to, to really um, identify. So really looking for the medium cap companies, with, which are probably 300, 500, 700 employees, probably even up to 1,000 employees. Mm -hmm. um, because the bigger the company gets, the harder it is for the leadership to actually trickle down and the mm -hmm. culture becomes a challenge, right? Because All the levels of management, etc. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. So really identifying the smaller size organizations, under 1,000 employees ideally. Mm -hmm. um, um, another one, you know, smart group, uh, there's smart salaries, salary packaging company. Uh, I think there are 500 or 700 employees. Um, that's where really you can see consistent growth there year on year. And I think it's truly because of the excessive focus on hiring the right people who are culturally aligned, aligned to their values um, and the CEO's passion for the culture. Well, and, and the other side of that is that you've, there's some statistics around how that flows into performance as well, isn't there? Correct. I remember Absolutely. you talking about that before. What are some of the, do you have those off the top of your head? So, I mean, um, I think companies that have a high performance culture probably outperform. There is a, a company called um, a book called um, run by Raj Sisodia who wrote conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but he all firms of endearment is called. Mm, okay. And in that he shows there's a chart in there, which shows that companies that were, I guess had more values driven organizations probably performed the S and P 500 by something like 50%. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking of. There's like they've they've done back testing on these businesses that, yeah. uh, and it's yeah, it was huge. So, so really the culture, and that's really the culture piece, and I think that's what's really driving consistent growth. And again, it's a long play, right? Mm. So it's it's a long term investment which companies which companies with great cultures are focused on. Well, it's a long term investment for the company, but like I suppose for an investment management side of things, you can get the benefit of that now because if they've done the, the right investment previously, then they should be getting the benefit from an outperformance um, standpoint. And, you know, a lot of CEOs say, yeah, we, we are great into culture, but, you know, saying one thing, doing is the other, right? So um, I think doing a bit of homework also around the CEO and if you've got any artists to write any blogs or podcasts or anything, but you can really hear the CEO talk, Mm -hmm. um, and I think you'll see the way, the way they talk and the way they talk about their people. Jeff Weiner at LinkedIn, uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, um, mm -hmm. Paul Coleman at Unilever, the list goes on. And the way they talk and they write their blogs and stuff, you can tell that they have an automatic passion for people, mm -hmm. um, which probably most CEOs won't even talk about. They'll start talking about results and shareholder value and mm -hmm. you know what we're doing as a business and da 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 da, da. So. I'd be interested to, to for the guys out there that if anyone knows of, um, I guess, 
ways to get exposure to businesses like this from a whether it's from a managed fund standpoint drop it in the group there so everyone anyone can um, check it out because uh yeah it's it's a pretty it's a cool concept it's it's um like it's if you've got a tick in terms of the human side of things you've got a tick in terms of investment outperformance to me it sounds like a no-brainer yeah. Uh, I guess it comes down to accessibility. Maybe for the fund managers out there, um, something to look at, and uh, maybe Vanguard can generate another index. Um, yeah, totally. a, there is an index I think in the US called it's called RIP. Um, okay. And they actually focus on uh, is it culturally great places to work. I'll send you the link anyways. Yeah, awesome. And they're very much uh, a fund that's focused on um, sustainability and culture, and they've identified which of those companies. Yeah, well, I know, um, I think B Corp has, there's actually, I think there might be an ETF exchange traded fund in the US that gives exposure to an index of B Corp businesses, which, um, yeah, Yeah. so it's just, I remember I was looking into that a while back and, um, yeah, uh, yeah, the US definitely has them for sure because the scale is much bigger there mm. Um, and they're all consistently growing. So there's definitely a, a sure bet there for sure. Yeah, great. So the um, so in terms of I guess the what we're doing with XY Advisor, here's your, here's, here's our free consulting, looking at um. So we're going to say it's okay, Manisha, okay, it's okay to be critical, um, especially around Clayton. Um, if you've got anything to say about him, uh, what what do you think um from a culture and leadership standpoint, um, uh, from what you've seen us us doing, what would you? Yeah. Well, man, I think you're doing a great job as it is. I think, um, to be honest, like you're saying, you're all over the place to all over the country doing great meetings and events. It's fantastic. And I think really the community is crying out for more. Um, so you probably can't do enough because there's so much time commitment and you guys are doing it as, you know, it's not your full-time job. So um, I think people want to learn more and they want to understand more about the space. So really passionate about it. the more you can engage and bring the community together, um, by sharing stories, lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work, you know, um, that's really, I think there's a lot of power in that. And I think uh, I'm really passionate about that. I don't, I don't believe any, most companies are not doing enough of that, where you bring your stakeholders as often as you can together. And you are going on a roadshow, right, which is fantastic, and keep doing that. And just mm-hmm. crank it up and even more and more so, you know. Ultimately, I keep told Clay as well, I said, mean, you guys got a, a chamber of commerce about to happen, you know. It's pretty much that's what we talking about is a new way of uh, investing so uh, and we have to keep educating and it's the key and this is what i'm doing with my events is educate 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 because we forget mm-hmm. yeah one of the interesting when you talk about stakeholders there and and bringing them in i think one of the more interesting aspects of what's happened with the xy advisor facebook group is um like initially we're like oh do you let product provide and service providers in and to me that's one of been been one of the most profound impacts those guys coming in and um, and just playing by the rules in terms of not flaunting products and contributing valuably to conversations, that's been awesome. But also the flow through and the impact on the industry, we're, we're seeing conversations in XY Advisor actually flow through and creating outcomes in yeah. terms of how businesses are making decisions, which I think uh-huh. is fantastic because um, like awesome. people with problems in, in XY Advisor are getting, getting heard directly. And uh, you, yeah, so that that's... Just sharing, that's, that's what I know firsthand of the impact that that's happening. So, um, you know, I've, I was speaking to the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, um, mm-hmm. Jack Simon O'Connor, and, you know, they're extremely passionate about this space. And, um, and I think he mentioned as well in his conversation, the challenge is everyone's passionate about responsible investing. The key issue is, you know, how do we get our own members to be more responsible internally with their people and their own sustainability efforts, mm. you know? Um, but so are you talking still, about, is he, is he walking the walk or is he still just talking the talk with this? <laughs> and he was, he was, he talked about it. He was, he was authentic. He goes, yeah, this is my challenge. How do I get each of my resp- members of our community um, to actually do the sustainability for their own companies? Mm. You know? um, they might be passionate about investing responsibly, but are they internally doing uh, themselves with their employees and, and stuff? So that's the, the question. Yeah, well, I think I think that's that's always been an interesting one with advice. For example, in terms of um, my stuff, when I was bringing them on, um, I got them to do a, a full fact find, and I, I do suggest it to other advisors that they actually walk through the advice process from the client side. And 
and um, and you have that insurance conversation with them and go, and they're like, well, I don't need it, like because they're often um, in their twenties, like the staff members that are coming into practices, and uh, yeah, I found that was a really good um, a good experience with them because it gave them a different perspective and sort of uh, got them to get in the mind of um, what a client would be experiencing. Correct. Correct. So, um, and, and also, I think, you know, there's a difference between being sustainable and, uh, you know, a lot of companies want to be sustainable and do the right thing sustainably and ethically. Mm-hmm. But if, there's no point if your people are being treated like shit. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, and this is for me, the, the difference between a, a great company and a, a good company and a great company is, yes, we do, you know, sustainability. We do all this stuff for the environment. But our people internally, the employee engagement score is like 30%. Right. Mm-hmm. So that for me is not a sustainable company. Okay. Actually, that's a good, that's a good point you raise around the employee engagement. So like we've said that the best way to just improve it is just spend time and be present with employees and sort of, um, and be open and um, allow them to um, have comfortable communication with you. But in terms of measuring where you're at, what are some of the ways that, um, so that engagement score and that sort of thing, how do they go a bit? Can you tell us a bit more about that and maybe, how advisors could do that internally with their businesses? Well, I mean, employee engagement score, a lot of people are critical of them as well because they do it once a year and they expect that that once a year is good enough and every year they'll do it. And it's big companies do that. And they that do it after the bonuses have been paid. Uh, yeah, correct. So <laughs> it's not really, you should know as a leader in your practice and in your team, what's if people are disengaged, right? You can tell. You can tell by the way they behave, by, you know, it becomes obvious when they're not really into it, into the work or they're just ticking the boxes and they can't wait to get out of the door. Um, so it's almost having a real conversation. You know, is this something you want to really be here or are you just doing this because you want to make a buck? Mm. Right. So it's more of an intuitive. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, tell me those, again, those honest conversations with people. Um, and that's the key is, it is, you know, what, what drives you. And if people will have passions outside of work, you know, how can you bring their passion into work? Mm-hmm. You know, are you passionate about, painting or you're passionate about, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, DJing, do you want to come and do a set after work on a Friday afternoon? I don't know, you know, something be really creative around how do we combine people's passion with work and, the, and, and bringing it together in the workplace? Because we are humans, man. We're not just machines at work and then humans after work, right? Mm. So it's almost how do you integrate the two to actually look at the entire person and saying, well, what else are you into, you know? You want, to bring your, you want to bring your dog to work today or something. You have a dog at home. and you get, So going beyond just that, come and do your job and get out of here. It's beyond that, right? Well, I know there's, there's a couple of good examples out in the advice industry of this, this occurring. Uh, Andrew Rocks from uh, Announcer Group, uh, they've done a lot of work around the health, health and wellness um, with their employees. So everyone yeah. wearing Fitbits, um, actually mandated time in the day for exercise within the working day. Awesome. And and yeah, they've they've um, I think they've gotten some uh, really good outcomes out of that in terms of uh, and they've looked into it. So it's um, yeah, if, if if anyone's listening, um, reach out to Andrew. <laughs> he did a great session with um with the uh, with the AFA uh, event the other night. Uh, it was really good, and he's sort of talking about a few of these things. So um, yeah, I think it's a bit sort of oh like. Everyone's got to sort of walk away today and actually do something off the back of this. Go have a chat with your, with your employees, take them for a beer. Or, um, and I guess, is, would, you, would you say that one side of it is actually sharing a bit more of yourself with them? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, to, if you want somebody to be real with you, you've got to be real first, right? Mm. You know, you can't expect to say, hey, listen, let's, you know, share something about what's going on for you. But they're like, well, I'm not sure because, you know, but if I say first, I'm, I take the lead and I share something about, who I am and what's my bit of my personal life like and whatever's going on for me on a personal front. And that allows gives permission for other people to open up and start sharing their, their what's going on for them. And, you know, mm-hmm. and it's that the world is becoming so um, integrated that there's really no difference between work and work and play anymore. You know, mm-hmm. it's people are on emails 24 hours. You, they're checking emails at night. They're working in the day. They're doing dropping kids at school in the daytime. So it's all, so you can't really draw a fine line anymore you know, mm. around work and, and home. It's just the same thing. Well, yeah, that's, it's, um, so I'm really getting a great exposure to that with the team in the Philippines that I'm working with. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, so you sort of, like, you've got this huge disconnect. They're in another country. Um, so forming those connections through conversation and 
um, when you can't have that physical presence, um, yeah, it's been pretty crucial. And then, and then I felt it's come down to just time on the on the phone or on Skype, really. Yeah, uh, yeah it's it, it just it's it's a really. I was I was hoping for some shortcuts, Manish, but you just you, <laughs> all you're saying is we just got to spend more time talking to people. Yeah, well, mate, you know the best businesses, no matter how big or small, are run like a family. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the owner or the runner or the business is pretty much like the dad or father or mother. Um, and basically, you got a bunch of people who are in the family. You treat them like your family. You treat them like your cousins. You're like your kids. You would, why would you treat some, an employee any different than you would your, your, your kids or your brother or your, or your, or your family? Why, why? Just because they're working with you. So eight hours a day you're with them. You're probably more mm. with them than you are with your own family. Mm. Um, so why would you be a different person? Well, I can see some issues arising for some people um, if they're reflecting on their relationships with their siblings. <laughs> right. So, in fact, you have a chance to create a new relationship, which is probably better than the one you have at home. <laughs> that, I think that's, that's, that's sort of um, going to tick the box with a few more people, I think. <laughs> and, you know, people spend 12 hours a day hanging out with their work colleagues sometimes. So, you know, you got to, it, it's the more human you can make that interaction, the better the, the conversation. Yeah, well, the, um, yeah, it's, have, have you, what have, what have the, some, some things that you've done in the past in terms of, uh, like, trying to broaden that um, engagement? With oh, man, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I've learned over time to be a bit more transparent about who I am, and I, I have no problem sharing any girlfriend challenges I have or, you know, or, um, you know, stuff that's going on, 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 on uh, at home with my family and stuff. You know, it's, it's so everyone has them. Everyone has issues with stuff with friends, family girlfriends, wives, husbands, kids, whatever. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's fair income to everyone's got them. And I have to share that first where then that's it. Oh, wow. Okay. Then it kind of starts to open up other people and they become more comfortable about sharing what's going on for them. And that builds the relationship. And therefore people become so close to that becomes like a family that they don't want to leave. Mm. You know, they just want to stick around because they're like, man, I can be myself in, in an office, which is so cool because no one, Holds me, uh, no one, you know, is is um, is looking at me strangely if I'm doing something different because that's just me, and I'm, I'm allowed to bring my whole self to the workplace. So is this? I don't know. I, I'm like, I'm taking this where I, I'd like to see it go. Is this? Is this a suggestion to sort of reduce um, things that may have been social conformity or social norms that maybe don't have a good reason for being there? Is that? Am I delving, am I taking too much out of this? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, people have this thing about rigidity between, you know, my, this is office and that's, you can't talk about certain things, right? Mm. And it's almost as a conditioning that's coming to play that this is just, this is professional and, you know, you have to just work and work and there's nothing else but work. Mm. But it's, that's not, that's not sustainable. It really isn't. And you can't, and I know in the past, we used to have put on a different mask in the workplace mm. and then go home and that mask has gone off and now I'm a, brother mother father whatever i am and it's like that's that's not congruent that's not authentic that's just uh bottling up stuff internally and um creating potential issues in the workplace you know yeah well i guess i'm trying to think about what i've got blocking i've, I've always been pretty good like um pretty open. Just sharing pretty open but the one thing that i haven't been doing it's sort of been like this one rule that i've got which is not having employees on facebook um yeah, right I don't know. What are you? Um, yeah, well, um, I've actually got my business call. You know, some of my leaders who spoke in my conferences, you know, one is a CFO, one is a CIO, marketing director. They're on my Facebook. You know, to be honest, what is on my Facebook that is super private? I mean, all my information is out there anyways. People know your data. I'm not sharing any. Uh, I honestly don't share anything on Facebook that's offensive. So um, they can look at my photos with my girlfriend or with my mate or whatever and so what <laughs> yeah see i think that could be the issue because um <laughs> even though recently there depending been... what you get up to with your girlfriend and <laughs> yeah i'm just like my my facebook goes back quite a bit and um i've right. matured in that time but early days i don't know there's been some good gold um i don't know if you'd want journalists getting in there but i suppose that's just complete um uh, vulnerability and open openness <laughs> Yeah, that's well. That's that's you have to decide what boundaries are right for you, I guess. Um, everyone's comfortable at different levels. Oh, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with it. I don't know. Do you think I should get rid of that rule? Should I add my well, employees I think, on Facebook or let or because, 
Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, if you look at their profile photos as well and their past photos, they probably have some photos back in the day. What's the worst? They were dressed up at a party, which was fancy dress or something, and you had maybe a couple of drinks too much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. What's, that's oh. probably the worst photo you've seen on Facebook. It's probably a slightly, you know, one couple of drinks down too much, Adrian. That's pretty much it, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's um, a lot of people have seen that. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's not really like it's um it's a it's a unique thing that people haven't seen um okay. quite close uh apparently there's a an event you've got on coming up what's what's coming up yeah with so on? we've got an event on november 15 called the change leadership summit mm -hmm. um changeleadership.com.au mm -hmm. um pretty much all about what does it take to lead change effectively mm -hmm. and how do we drive change within the within businesses so it's all about values-based leadership and the importance of what do you, who do you have to be as a leader to drive successful change? So okay. yeah, come along if you guys can. How do, how do people get involved with that? Oh, just this website, changeleadership.com.au. Mm -hmm. um, and it's on our, on our page as well, humanityandbusiness.com.au. So awesome. all details are there and uh, just uh, get in touch and happy to give you a discount because you're listening to the podcast. Ah, nice one. Everyone, everyone likes a good discount. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, so I think if, if you guys, if anyone's been listening out there and, and they, um, they like the idea of it, they're not sure about the next steps, maybe, maybe checking out what uh, Manish has been doing, check out his website and um, there might be something in there for you to just, uh, yeah, take a bit of action and walk the walk. Yeah. Manish, thank you for, for coming on. Uh, it's been Thanks, great talking to you. Thanks for sharing uh, your experience with what you've been yeah, doing. It was a pleasure. I really it's enjoyed all... that. Good fun. It's an awesome project that you've been working on and like the fact that um, it's going up after quite a number of years and it's still, um, still, still moving around. forward, it's, yeah. um, it's a testament. Yeah, so well yeah, done. Thanks, man. Thank you. And good on you guys for keep on doing the great work XY is doing. I love it. And um, I'm sure you got all your community really enjoys being part of it. So keep up the great work as well, XY team. Good on you, man. Good on you, Adrian. Yeah. Thanks, Manish. Well, just, just a shout out to the guys in Melbourne tonight that are coming to the event. Looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, we've got a sold out event. It's sold out for a few weeks. Uh, it's at this great whiskey joint, uh, Candelaria or something. Um, looking forward to it. It's going to be going to be fun. And uh, yeah, we'll see everyone uh, next week for.